Welcome everybody, this is Truth Toothpaste. I want to welcome you back to the podcast. Today's subject is going to be on digital tyranny. If you haven't heard just today, we've had some major bannings of uh, some very large and very long-term projects on the internet. Uh, ironically, both on the right and the left, and um, one of them takes the form of um, the Donald finally being banned, which uh, off of Reddit, which is ironic because um, it, they had already been like effectively comatose, like shut down. Nobody had been running it for months, and it was impossible to post on it for months. So basically, it's like it's been on a stay of execution for months, and they've been like toying with the Donald the whole time. And today they just finally decided to, you know, finally throw the switch. There was like, there was no legitimate discussion involved there. There was no like legitimate process that could have been followed. Basically, you were just in a situation where Reddit wanted the Donald gone. They either wanted to destroy the Ron the Donald so that it ceased to be an effective, you know, community gathering place for supporters of Donald Trump, or they wanted it gone entirely. And so they constructed and set up a special subset of rules, a special subset of standards that applied distinctly to the Donald, and then even lied about that. They, they even going so far as to completely shut down the site, uh, the subreddit, was not enough to stay reddit's hand in this case and they made a few other gestures to make them seem uh even-handed like they got rid of chapo Tra uh, trap house which is the only reason i know it is because they people from those forums come and brigade other uh, subreddits which means like if if they disagree with you they just come and downvote you and make nasty troll comments and insult you and call you a, a racist bigot and you know whatever else they they can come up with even though they know absolutely nothing about you so, um, also another one that I was not seeing, I was, I was really surprised, Stefan Molyneux was banned by YouTube, uh, not through their normal process, not through their whole three strikes, you know, normal process that they have, it's just boom, overnight you are gone, and seeing the way that this process is going on, it doesn't really seem like it's um like it's a legitimate process it looks like the only interests that have been served by this combination of actions that have been taken are like like a real narrow subset of corporate interests like there's you know who if you go and you ban these people on both sides of the aisle and prevent them from having you know a natural debate process whatever that might be who really benefits from this and and, and the only thing that makes any sense is that you know the people serving up ads at the top they don't want to be associated with extremists on either side of the aisle. And all they're concerned about is money. They're not concerned about political discourse. They're not concerned about uh, how important free speech is to society. They're not concerned about even their own rules in most cases. They're only really concerned about advertising dollars and keeping uh, those people who spend advertising dollars on their platforms happy, and they will do whatever is necessary to make those people happy, including breaking their own internal rules and applying them unevenly. And um, so basically, but, but this podcast isn't really about specifically the people who have been banned today. Although I think those are tragic and wrong, this kind of thing has been going on for a while. You had the coordinated assault on Alex Jones a while back, and like Alex Jones or don't like Alex Jones, I think Alex Jones has a right to speak. And if your platform is too, you know, too weak and too milly-mouthed and too to handle uh, somebody like Alex Jones who occasionally goes off the rocker and says some crazy shit... 
well then what's wrong with your platform why can't your platform have the settings and flexibility and options necessary to accommodate somebody like an alex jones or to accommodate people on the extreme right and the extreme left um even if extreme right and extreme left is an accurate description it's more like you have corporate interests and either you fall in line with those big corporate interests or you don't fall in line with those big corporate interests and that's that's all that matters. It's really not about politics. But <clears throat> like I said again, this is not about the particular people who have been banned. This is about digital tyranny and why digital tyranny is a problem that may even be worse than real life tyranny. And you're saying, oh, the, these are private institutions and so don't uh, they have a right to ban whoever they want, make up whatever silly laws, that, rules that they want. Um, yeah, maybe. Okay, L let's start there. I'm, but, I, but what I want to talk about is the negative effects of that, because you know some of the um, the counter the counterclaim today is the hashtag bake the cake. So if you're not familiar, a while back in uh, Colorado, there was a extremely Christian uh, baker who would make wedding cakes and birthday cakes and whatever, but he would not make certain cakes based on his Christian religion. If you asked him to make you a Halloween cake, he's like one of those people that are so Christian, uh, they can't celebrate Halloween because they think it's, you know, satanically inspired or something like that or pagan or, or whatever. I don't really know the explanation. I just know the guy wouldn't celebrate Halloween, and if you asked him for a Halloween cake, he'd say, sorry, we don't make Halloween cakes here. And he got sued by a couple of guys who were shopping for a lawsuit. They were going from place to place, um, trying to find someone who wouldn't make them a gay wedding cake. And so when they approached this very Christian baker and he refused to make them uh, the gay wedding cake, um, they sued him and he had to go through all of these legal troubles and he was doxxed and, and he had death threats and hate mail all because, you know, this extremely Christian guy, uh, was not, a, his faith was not respected and they wanted to force him in particular to make them a gay wedding cake. And so it, it's kind of, now you're in a situation where you have a, a hypocrisy, where you have a paradox here, right? In, in one instance, you've got people on the left strongly saying that this private baker has to be forced to make this gay couple uh, a wedding cake. But in another instance, they're saying a platform like Google, um, you know, Facebook, Reddit, YouTube uh, doesn't have to accommodate people based on their political ideology. So, you know, in one stance, you've got, uh, y you just get into a semantic battle. It's like, well, why is this one group over here protected and you have to serve this group? But these other groups of people over here, um, they can be discriminated against and eliminated and denied service um, based on those groups. And so you either get into a system that is clearly unfair or hypocritical, right? No matter how you try to define it or justify your position that, oh, this one group deserves the protection and this other group doesn't deserve the protection, you're, you're, all you're doing then is enshrining an inherently unfair system and trying to come up with a justification for it post hoc, like saying, oh, we're going to make an unfair system specifically because of X, Y, and Z, and uh, then not owning the fact afterwards that it is actually an unfair system. But even this is not the final thrust of this argument against digital tyranny because some other people have pointed out is that on the internet um, punishment does not follow punishment the way it does in real life like uh, that punishment is much harsher on the internet that for something that might represent a, uh, a minor infraction or something that might get you tossed out of a shop or a bar for a single day or at a single branch of a uh, business, 
um, you know, temporarily, basically gets you eliminated forever from these uh, only really a handful of major websites, right? That serve this kind of very central function to the point that they're, you know, there's a very good case that can be made that they're that they're like utilities. Like there's, uh, you know, if if the freeway was all owned by one company and they could decide arbitrarily whether you could drive on the freeway or not, and it wasn't based on any kind of standards, it was just however the the owners of the freeway felt today, that would be a real big problem because there's really not room for another freeway and it doesn't make sense to build a competing freeway. So when you've got a couple of, a handful of companies that are running pseudo monopolies like YouTube and Facebook and Reddit, you know, th these handful of sites that dominate the marketplace in their respective categories, um, you, you run into a real problem. And it's because they're they're handing out digital death sentences for for their infractions, and a lot of times they're applying these rules retroactively based on new rules that they've decided to come up with recently because their corporate masters have decided to shift their position, and something that was okay five years ago is no longer okay now. And this has to do with the kind of binary nature of the internet and digital technology in general, that it's a world made up of ones and zeros. And it's not like real life in that life, real life is full of degrees, right? That there's you know, any number of gray areas. And it seems like there's just fewer gray areas in the digital world. And I'll try to give you an example. Let's say that for some reason you were this horrible troll uh, to Burger King, and I'm not picking on Burger King in specific, I'm just using them as a brand a lot of people would know. And let's say you, you've just been uh, harassing Burger King in some, or they don't like your ideology or your politics, or you've been misusing their, their showrooms. You, you've pissed off Burger King somehow. The reason isn't really important. Um, so what would happen in real life if you pissed off Burger King, right? Well, maybe you would piss off the assistant manager at Burger King and the assistant manager says, hey, I don't want to see you around here at Burger King anymore. And if I ever catch you here, I'm going to toss you out on the street. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe they, the, the assistant manager gets away with that because they could deny service and or they could point to some legitimate thing that they did that uh to to justify kicking them out right well let's, let's say they're justified at, at kicking you out of the burger king and the assistant manager they've got it out for you and they want you gone and anytime you walk into that burger king and the assistant manager sees you they're like get the hell out you're not getting any food from here uh, and, and i don't care uh if you've got money or whatever and, they, and so you you've made the assistant manager at burger king very angry and so you've limited the amount of service you can get at this burger king but really, uh, it's not like getting a ban from YouTube or Reddit or or any of these other places. Like, well, there's probably another Burger King right down the road. And I probably don't even have to go that far. Um, I could probably sneak through the drive through at Burger King and uh, not have anybody notice me till it's too late, right? Or I could come in with a hat and shades on and, and and sneak through Burger King and still get probably still get service even while the assistant manager at Burger King is up there uh, still carrying whatever grudge they have out over me over whatever legitimate uh, thing I did that to, to deserve to get kicked out of Burger King, right? So if if uh, one I uh, walk up to the counter and if and if the general manager is there instead of the assistant manager or it's the night shift manager or it's just the flunky that they just hired. Uh, and the assistant manager is on break or on lunch or whatever, and they don't see me, I'm still getting service at this Burger King, right? So I, I've committed a transgression, a legitimate transgression against Burger King, and yet, you know, the vast majority of Burger King branches are still available to me for service. They probably don't have my face plastered up on the wall as do not serve this person in all whatever number of hundred or thousands of branches of um, Burger King franchises across the world, right? So even though I have pissed off this service, and maybe maybe rightfully so, 
I can still get Burger King pretty much any time I want and probably any t uh, most of the time I want from that one branch there, right? So compare that to some kind of infraction on Reddit or YouTube or Google or Facebook or whatever, any of these big companies. If you get infractions from them, that's it. You have no recourse because they throw one switch, one switch for the whole internet. You are gone. You're completely gone from every branch, all the services that they offer, all of the features that they offer, all of the people you could probably connect to, all of the different sub elements and groups that make up this uh, uh, category from these. You are gone from all of them. It's the same as if the uh, assistant manager at one branch of Burger King was able to get you effectively banned from all all Burger Kings across the world. And, and in this case, it's not really a case of is that assistant manager justified or not. It's that that assistant manager has so much more power in the digital world than they have in the real world. You, you see the imbalance there? You piss off one night shift assistant manager at Facebook or YouTube or Google or, or whoever, and you're completely gone from their all their services at once. You've got no recourse. There's no, you know, there's probably no ban uh, settlements kind of things. Whereas in the real life, in real world, you know, you can do a lot of stupid shit. And maybe you can deserve it, or maybe it's a misunderstanding, but it doesn't matter if it was deserved or a misunderstanding. You piss off one night shift assistant manager at YouTube or Google or wherever, and you're gone. And in a lot of cases, you don't really even have to break the rules. They just have to not like you. And if they don't like you, or they're not making money off of you, or the corporate overlords that are spending ad revenue on their services don't like you... They can drop the hammer and they don't need a good reason and they don't need the, there's no way to for them to be held accountable and they have this vast amount of power even compared to the real world government so let let's let's even throw somebody who should have more authority than a business right the actual government you know the elected enshrined authority over the uh, over the population you know supposedly the the last law of the land in regards to uh, the use of violent force you know the the government the, the you know the last line that that there is in terms of who gets to make decisions right even the government has less relative power when it comes to carrying out its sentences and its laws than some of these online services do when they give you a, a, ban, a permanent ban, a death sentence from their service. Because first off, if you commit a transgression in real life, uh, you have to be caught. Then you have to be proved guilty uh, through this lengthy process that has a prosecutor deciding whether or not they have enough time, energy, and money to prosecute your case in particular. Uh, a grand jury has to look at the evidence and decide, that, is, is there enough uh, case going on that then they have to work you through the schedule and it might take six months and they might have to provide you a, a court funded lawyer and they're spending money the whole time. So, you know, it's, it's just, you can't just throw a switch somewhere and get rid of a guy you don't like arbitrarily when it comes to the government. And that's if you can catch the guy in the first place, you know, and do you have enough time? So at the end of the day, the government actually hands out very few punishments uh, for crimes, and maybe the crimes have to change their behavior or go underground a little bit um, to evade detection better. Uh, but there's the government has to pick and choose uh, which laws it's going to enforce vigorously and which, which ones they ha uh, have to make. Um, which ones they can afford to enforce vigorously because if they don't enforce the rules vigorously, it becomes a joke, right? 
I mean, it's like around here, and, and it may be different where you're at, so don't start going 10 miles an over, hour over the speed limit where you're at, but I have never gotten a speeding ticket for going less than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. 10 is like a gimme here, and it may even be more than that on the interstate in certain places. But basically, there's the line in there somewhere that I seem to get warning tickets for going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, but I seem to have to pay the tickets if, I, if I'm if i going 12 miles over the speed limit. And don't judge me, for a long time I had no speeding tickets, and then I just completely flipped to a period of my life where I had two-hour commutes every day, and I just started doing a ton more driving, and I started figuring these things out, okay? So that's just an example is that, you know, te uh, you know by the technical law of the land, uh, they can pull over pretty much everybody on the freeway because nobody is doing the speed limit. Everybody is going 10 over the speed limit, right? And, you know, it, it's just like plea bargaining. You, you have all these times where, like, um, there was a break-in where I work. And at the end of the day, when we added up all the total losses to ourselves and our clients, you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars was a total damage plus total items lost. So it's probably a misdemeanor, except for the fact that they were carrying a weapon. Um, so what's the likelihood that these individuals are going to be caught and prosecuted for this one specific act that they did? Um, very low. First off, um, you know, they have to be physically caught. They weren't physically caught. Um, the, the police department has limited resources to investigate crimes and they have to prioritize, uh, certain crimes over other crimes. So a, uh, misdemeanor level, um, theft ch charge just isn't going to rise to the level of, um, you know, warranting a ton of police resources. Yeah, they came out here and took the police report and they looked over it and they said they would get back to me. But honestly, that day was the last day I heard anything from them in regards to this break-in that occurred at my workplace. So even something as serious as a robbery where, where the robbers carried a, a deadly weapon uh, doesn't really rise to the level that the government is willing to apply a lot of resources because we require we recovered some evidence and probably if they had enough time and money to run a DNA test on some of the stuff they left behind because they left behind the weapon and uh, some bolt cutters, uh, we could probably catch these guys. But they don't have the money for a DNA test. Uh, they don't have the necessary time and effort to put forward to crossing these guys. So these people did something that is materially more serious than anything that could possibly happen on, you know, most things that could happen on a purely digital format. You know, what happens on a digital format? Somebody says something you doesn't like, hurts your feelings, says something subjective that gets your uh, panties in a wad, and in a very few cases, they might be inciting violence, right? So basically, online, you, ha you have a whole extra step that you have to go through to even get close to any kind of physical uh, reality of loss, and yet... For any of those uh, kind of online infractions on any of these service, you can get the equivalent of a death sentence, a permanent death sentence. It would be like if we caught these misdemeanor level criminals that we would effectively give them a summary execution for their misdemeanor level crime if we took the same dynamics that exist in the digital world where everything's being constantly recorded, everything is monitored, everything you say is completely stored for posterity, there's absolutely nothing that you can do, you know, there's no switch that we can throw down at the local police department that pulls the user IDs of the three guys that broke into my place and tell me, uh, and, and bans their living service and uh, or or quarantines them or whatever right so you have this completely different dynamic 
where authority is much more powerful online than they are in the real world is that most of the laws are getting broken all the time in the real world. They, they just don't rise to the level of justifying the amount of resources that we need to take to keep a relatively amount of order in society. And if we were to transpose that, oh my God, it would just be horrible. It would be like, it would be like living in the worst kind of, um, you know, 1984, all of these dystopian world books, you know, if the real world operated like the digital world, it would just be crazy because in the real world, when something bad happens, it really has to be a priority for us to do something drastic about it. You know, we might be upset about it. I might be a little shaken about the fact that there was a break in at my property and I don't like it. And some people lost some stuff. But at the end of the day, do I want to see anybody die because of it? No. Do I, do I want somebody's voice to be eliminated forever from, from society because they did some stupid thing by breaking into my uh, property and, and stealing some um, property from people? No. Uh, I wouldn't want that. I would want, you know, a basic level of reprints. But really, the dynamic here is... The digital world has complete monitoring and they have absolute dictatorial control and it is very cheap and easy for them to enforce sweeping policies. You know, like I said, the fact that it can be done so easily, there's always risk in imposing your dictates or the law in real life, those are the things that, that the local police department are weighing and the local judges are weighing. It's like, or even the legislatures when they're making a law, you know, they're sitting back and thinking, it's like, do we really want to make this much of the population felons overnight by passing this law? And there and there's even books on this topic that, that there are so many laws already. That if we just monitored your day-to-day -day activities that you think are completely normal, you'd actually be co uh, committing multiple felonies over the course of just a few days. If we saw absolutely everything that you were doing in your day-to-day -day life, it's just because there's all these laws in the books and you don't even know all of them. But because there was no omnipotent eye there to see what you were doing at that time, uh, you, didn't, you didn't receive a punishment for those felonies that, that you don't even know about, right? So it kind of brings us back to this whole idea that digital, digital punishment is way out of scale compared to the kind of punishments that we hand out in real life. And it's just because of the nature of computers. Computers don't have the same limitations on power and energy and resources. You know, I don't, if I'm going to ban 50,000 people off of YouTube, I don't need an army to do that. I don't need an army to enforce my law. I don't need a lot of guys with guns to go out and enforce my new po policy. I just have one coder guy with admin access somewhere who throws a switch. And this is like, Basically, our largest and, and in some cases very important to global and national discourse on different issues, services, these information sources that we use to keep in track, keep in touch with our loved ones and discuss subjects and any of these things, these big corporate companies that we rely on for this, they have that level of sweeping control that can just wipe out entire populations as if they were uh, nuking them off the face of the earth and not even with the same negative effects of a nuke because it's clean, you know, it's clean and disinfecting and it's hands off and they don't have to struggle. They don't have to have that visceral human to human contact of having to physically enforce your judgment on people and doing it over and over and over again. You know, it, it's very clean. They just press a button and they're like, oh, yeah, 
we've got rid of all those bad people in group X that we hate so much. And it's really like these very important services are, are no different than a child running a Minecraft server, except you can never log off of that Minecraft server. Just imagine that, like, if your real life was a simulation and there was an administrator, and that administrator had the same kind of power that Twitter and YouTube and all these people have, it would be a dystopia because their power would be uh, complete. They would see all, they would be able to go back in time and see everything, they would be able to view any type of records, and they would be able to single you out and eliminate people without any real cost to them themselves, because they just have to press a button. There is no cost for them to enforce these laws, so there is no buffer. There's no second thoughts. There's no, you know, scratching of the chin and saying, you know what, should I really invest the time and energy to prevent this person or this group of people from doing what they're doing because I'm going to have to invest a considerable amount of my time and energy to enforce this policy and it's going to mean I can't do something else. So that natural friction, that natural pushback that you get or would get from having too many rules and from being too arbitrarily tyrannical you just don't have that in the digital world. And so you've got these companies that are getting away with way too much. And that's my opinion, that they have gone way too far. And they are going to hurt themselves. And I think, honestly, what's going to ha have to happen is there's going to be a radical decentralization at, at some point. That people are going to lose faith the same way... We've lost faith in the mainstream media. We're going to lose faith in these big companies, and we're going to have to go back to small people that don't have these uh, built-in invested interests, you know, corporate interests, pulling at their strings all the time. The only way you can get to truth or reality is by getting somebody whose interests aren't already corrupted by uh, having income interests in these different platforms. So I hope you can see the connection there, um, that basically a bigger and bigger chunk of our lives and our communication is getting funneled into these services where it's like it's being run by children with God powers on a Minecraft server, you know, that they can do whatever they want and whether it makes sense or not, it doesn't matter because there's no feedback loop, there's no cost at least in the short term. The only, the only real cost to them is in their legitimacy. And I think we're going to see that slowly play out over time. Anyway, everybody, that's my thoughts on it. This has been Truth Toothpaste on the Truth Toothpaste podcast. Please, uh, if you've come with me this far, like and subscribe to the podcast, and I will see you next time.